I'm not going to um, take too much time. I'm Tony Wright. I'm moderating the session, but I'm really not doing anything. I'm just here to introduce Chris. Um, he'll talk a little bit more how brands should think about the web and the metaverse. I'm, with, for, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Chris Alvarez. Thank you. Uh, so thank you all for, for being here. When I was looking at the agenda, I saw that there was one around... Um, there's one on comedy and stand-up comedy. I was like, man, that sounds good. And then I saw that, that I was up against that person. I was like, OK. So I appreciate everyone here uh, coming to the talk. And so a um, couple of things. We'll go through an introduction. I always like to have an agenda slide. Uh, we'll talk about what is Web3 in the metaverse, and then how can brands utilize that technology um, to potentially further their, um, their ecosystem and their user base as well. Uh, so a little bit about me. Uh, I've been working for a company called PMG for about the last 10, 11 years now, um, I started as employee three. We were in the small shop in Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, we were in basically a closet at the time, and, and now we've grown. We work with some really, really cool brands. Uh, we, we just um, onboarded Nike, which is really, really exciting for, for us here. Um, I lead our Alley technology, which is our internal marketing technology um, and, and data and insight solution. Uh, and then just personally, I love everything that is data, tech, and creative related, all of them, which really spans everything. So it's like saying that I love everything. But in reality, those are my, my three things that I really, really like doing. Um, just a little bit about PMG. And I promise there's only two slides. I have to put these slides because they paid for my Uber to get here. Um, uh, PMG, we, we, uh, we, we manage globally. We, we manage uh, media across the globe, um, 20 languages. We have about 500, and I think now that number is about 600 employees as, as, as we've grown. Um, over $2 billion of, of media spend. So we, we work across a large scale. What's really awesome is we really started as a performance shop. I remember coming to State of Search in 2016 uh, as, as, a, as a, um, an attendee and then growing it and, and actually speaking in, I think, 2018 and then now uh, 2022 as well. So really exciting. I'm still a performance marketer at heart. Um, that's how I started in, in the industry and that's how we started. But we've branched out. Um, we've grown our creative, our technology, and our insights practices as well. So that's uh, a little bit, hopefully, why um, you will listen to me talk about Web3 and the metaverse, because we've, we've done a little bit of that. Um, so let's talk about what Web3 and the metaverse really is. Uh, a lot of folks think it's this, where you have VR goggles, and you're inside a, um, you're inside a virtual world. It's very much a uh, Ready Player One if you've seen that movie where it's it's all about you put on a headset and you're in a completely different world, which is, I think, the end goal. Um, and there are a lot of companies that want to basically make that happen. Um, the biggest one being Mark Zuckerberg and Meta, who basically changed his entire company's name to have this goal, which is which is in, in, insane to think about. Um, his stockholders also believe that it's insane to also do that because their stock, as a stockholder, uh, has not been doing so well as of late. But um, he does have this vision of having everything and, and um, you know, having everyone in, in VR and, and really um, uh, talking and communicating. And he sees it as the future of social media. Um, but what's interesting is I already think that the metaverse is already here. It's not necessarily the future. It's something that is currently happening. And a lot of brands are taking advantage of the fact that it is new. And it is something that they want to experiment and play around with. Um, it doesn't have to be about virtual goggles, um, is the way I look at it. And those things are super expensive. I was, I was asking them, I was like, hey, can we provide everyone Oculus? And they were like, no, no, Chris, that is $1,500. That's out of budget. Um, and I was like, darn. But I do want to take you back a little bit. Um, talking about the future, let's talk about the past a little bit. And when, when I looked at VR and I looked at the metaverse, it brought me back to AOL Instant Messenger. How many of you in the past have used AOL Instant Messenger or MSN Messenger? Yeah, uh, I, I'm originally from Canada, so I had friends that um, used MSN Messenger, and then I had American friends that used AOL Instant Messenger. So I was on both of them. And what's really interesting about AOL Instant Messenger is I was about 12, I think, when I started using it, maybe even a little bit younger than that, but it was really the first time that you could be anonymous online, where you could have your uh, screen names and, and really uh, be anonymous. And for me, it was the first time I was able to talk to girls because I was anonymous. 
Um, so it was it was it was fun because I would I, I'd have this crush on a girl and I would like talk and I'd be like set up my own screen name and I'd be like, hey, hi, how's it going? And she'd be like, who are you? Is what? You yeah, I, I true. I, I they could have been guys too. I don't know at that point. Um, <laughs> Who knows? But what's interesting is this: is that these skills, where I had group chats, I had um, I, I had uh, people that I was talking to, um, and I had message or I had uh, large group chats that were constantly going. Actually, was a great life skill for me. Um, as in 2015, we launched Slack, and Slack is a very similar concept to AOL Instant Messenger, and I think those skills translated because we actually did a, a, a study a survey at our company around who um, uh, who used AOL and Messenger and you know their their MPS when it came to Slack. As we started rolling out Slack as a company, we found that the people who had been part of AOL and Messenger or MSN Messenger as kids, where they started learning how to do that, were actually significantly more comfortable using Slack as their communication tool of choice. A lot of folks who did not found Slack to be a little overwhelming at first, and there was a larger, uh, there's a larger learning curve for that. So the skills that we had as kids do typically transfer over um, in some sort of way as well. Um, and so when we talk about metaverse, I like to think of, people ask me what was the first metaverse that came about, and I always said it was World of Warcraft. Although there, it wasn't, World of Warcraft wasn't the first like online community where you can go in. There was Second Life, there was others. But I feel like this one was the first one that actually sort of broke-ish mainstream, where you had friends who were meeting other friends that were virtual, and they were meeting together. They were meeting online. Um, we actually, I have a coworker who is from New Zealand who met her husband who's in Texas, and, and that's actually how they got together was they played World of Warcraft. So even that story about people getting married over uh, by meeting over World of Warcraft is actually a, a true story. And so I didn't believe it when I first met her and she said she met her husband on World of Warcraft, but it's absolutely true. And while World of Warcraft was uh, you know a, a not as mainstream as, as some of the other stuff is today, today we see kids and, and we see young adults playing in metaverses as in the same way that we as millennials and 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 uh, uh, that, that we had um, AOL Instant Messenger. They're, they're playing Roblox, they're playing Minecraft. I cannot get my cousin to stop playing Minecraft in the car. Like when I'm talking to him, like it's just on, it's just there and like it, he is in his zone and he's playing with his friends. They're all in the worlds together. They're building worlds and some of them he, he hasn't, you know, they moved, uh, Two years ago, and he's still chatting with them. He's still playing with them in Minecraft and in Roblox. So it's it's really interesting. Um, and then, so if we fast forward a little bit, the way we look at the way I look at it is in 2020, COVID hit. Uh, we had lockdowns, and we had remote work. And remote work started to become a really, uh, really a, a huge part of how we operate businesses. Um, we still talk about um, hybrid models and like how people wanted to work remote, and it turns out that people liked actually working remotely. Uh, people liked doing Zoom calls and being able to not have to commute an hour there and an hour back during rush hour traffic. Uh, it was a good thing. And so it did leave a gap, though, where managers and, and people were not getting FaceTime with their employees. And so um, there, there are actually companies that are trying to figure this out from, uh, this one's called EXP reality that has their own metaverse where there's actually conferences and there's uh, there's an IT desk where you can actually uh, walk up to somebody who works in the IT department and if they're online that'll show up they'll their metaverse character will show up it's it's a really really cool experience and when I look at things like this I think back and I say those those gen those gen Zers those gen alphas who are right now playing Roblox, are they gonna be more comfortable in an environment like this versus an environment where they're going to the office? And I look at it and I say, absolutely. Like that's how they're growing up. They're tied to that screen from, uh, from 12 years old and they're talking to their friends there. This is how they're communicating right now is through this metaverse where they can work wherever they want. They can work on an iPad probably while driving in a Tesla that can drive itself 10 years from now. And, and they can just be working alongside their coworkers in this way. And so to, to me, this is a weird concept because I would never want to do this. I'd rather just 
have Slack. I'd rather have Zoom. Um, but are, are the new generation going to feel more comfortable with this? Potentially, yes. And so this is why, as a brand, you have to start looking at this new virtual reality. Um, and I think this is something that is, is super impactful to, um, to the business and, and, and potentially how, uh, how we look at how companies should be looking at it. Um, how looking at it, the metaverse. This is a great segue for new people coming in. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> cool. Sorry for y'all. I'm assuming you went to the comedy session and they may have kicked you out. I don't know. But yeah. Oh, no. Technical difficulties. Well, uh, Welcome to the metaverse. We're all here. We all we all are receiving Oculuses later today. I'm just kidding. We're not. Um, but yes, only the people that were here from the very beginning. Yes, um, yes. And and so um, want to talk about how brands can think about how to how to use this new technology um, called metaverse. And what's what's really interesting is we have had a few brands ran, run media campaigns in the metaverse. And the way I look at it is a little bit of a different thing. The metaverse is, is sort of like a, a new world. Um, and it's sort of like a reset for brands because no one's in it right now. Um, and, and so when we talk to when we talk to people about their physical brand presence versus their virtual one, we find that a lot of times the value proposition is not the same. Because for physical goods and, and virtual goods, it's it's very, very different. And the brand equity for physical goods doesn't necessarily mean you have brand equity in the virtual space. A good example of this is so I recently, I know this game came out a long time ago, but there was a Legend of Zelda game where it was open world and they um, they had like these different armor suits you can wear. And one of them was a Nintendo Switch t-shirt that had a rating of one, which is like the lowest rating. And then you had like the regular one that people wore that had a rating of 15, which is like one of the highest. And so the way I look at it is I've never seen anybody in this game when I played it wear this Nintendo Switch shirt um, when, when they're live streaming. Going back to the first presentation, they live stream these games. Um, they're, they're all wearing something like this because their users, their audiences see value in this, the Helian hood. Um, hopefully I'm saying that right. I don't know. But uh, so to, to a person in, who's working in the metaverse or, or in the metaverse, they, the perceived value of these two items, there's really no reason why anyone would wear this. And I would say it actually hurts the brand as well if it's not as powerful as anything else because it seems like it's an inferior product. And so it's kind of weird to say that a virtual good, when they're really identical, is an inferior product. But that's the way the metaverse users are thinking about things whenever they're, um, they're actually interacting with objects inside the metaverse. Is there, there is an example of an inferior product versus superior product. And so one of the examples of this is uh, we actually had um, a, a client, Athleta, run a pretty large metaverse, um, a, a large metaverse campaign for their new uh, Athleta Girl um, line, which is uh, something we partnered with Simone, Simone Biles with. Um, and it really had a powerful message. Um, and we, we partnered with Roblox. And, and inside of Roblox, there's a game called Livetopia. And we actually ran a lot of billboards inside of the metaverse. Um, and, and you could see they had really, really strong, powerful messaging um, that Simone Biles and, and the team created to, to make sure that women feel empowered and, and girls felt empowered to, to be their best self. Um, what's interesting about this is that in Roblox, they had an offering around running billboards and running ads and, and things like that. And uh, it's, it's sort of like, it's still like running a billboard ad in in today's age as a physical good, it, it was very difficult, actually. Um, it was very difficult to measure. It was very difficult to see who saw it. And, and you know, the, the, uh, the success of the billboard itself is, is up to, um, in, in the same way that a billboard, if you put it on the highway, you would try to figure out if there's any success there. Um, but what was actually more impactful was actually they created a immersive experience and, and had a uh, as part of the Livetopia mall, they had a little non-playable character here who you could run up to and talk to 
and they would basically give you a free tote bag. And the tote bag increased the, the number of items you could have, and it looked really, really cool. And uh, the, the Roblox users actually got value out of having a Athleta tote bag out of the, the, um, the game. So it was a really, really cool experience. And this is actually what drove the most success out of the entire campaign. It wasn't the billboards. It wasn't the influencers behind the, um, the, the, uh, the campaigns who actually promoted the material. It was actually the fact that we gave a free bag in, in Livetopia and um, it actually did something inside the game. So every, everyone was going in and trying to go into the store to try to get this one bag. So very, very interesting. Um, the, the, the funny part about this story is, um, so I have a coworker who has a, a, a daughter who plays Roblox, and uh, they were driving down the highway, and they passed an athletic store. And the, the daughter was basically like, oh, hey, this is the store that's in Roblox. Uh, and her mom was like, yeah, but it, you know it's been a physical store for like a long time, right? And she's like, no, 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 we need to go to that because I want to get the same tote bag that I have for my Roblox character. So to her daughter, this Athleta was not a yoga and, and fitness brand. It was a Roblox integration that gave her a really, really cool tote bag. So her daughter didn't see Athleta as a, a normal brand. They saw it as a virtual brand that actually gave them a benefit. Um, so it's a different way of thinking when it comes to uh, the virtual space versus the um, versus the, the physical uh, space. And, and, and the brand didn't translate. For her daughter, she had no idea that Athleta existed outside of Roblox. But the brand bought her value inside of Roblox, so she was a fan of the brand. Um, it's a really, really cool and an interesting concept there. And so the way I look at it, and I have a lot of stories about this, but as marketers, for the first time in a long time, we actually have influence in virtual presence and products. I don't remember the last time as marketers that we actually had uh, uh, we actually had a lot of say in what goes into a product. Typically, there's like a product designer and there's a creative person and there's everything. And but now that's that's shifting. Um, uh, we, we've had customers who've had merchandising teams who control the products and what products they want to sell and, and how much they're going to sell it for and how much the sales are for sit in different buildings from the creative team and from the marketing teams who are actually trying to build equity around these, these products. And so um, sometimes they never talked, sometimes it was a fight, but in the end, I think now when we talk about the metaverse, we as marketers have more say into what happens um, and, and, and really uh, what we do inside of the metaverse and how we build brand equity inside the metaverse. And so I like to say that there are three optimization levers. I'm still a performance marketer at heart, so optimization levers is something that I still want to talk about. Um, I still think that's things that are across the board, but it's really products, audience, and creative. Um, I'm going to go uh, right to left here. Um, I know it's backwards, and I probably could have added the deck, but anyway. Um, so I want to talk about creative first. So for a long time, the workflow for us as marketers been, and let me know if, if this isn't the way for, for uh, this is probably isn't the way for every brand, but I do want to say for a lot of brands, um, the creative team creates something, they get a brief from their CMO and they, they create something great. And now they're like, hey, here, go market it. Go put it on YouTube, go put it on search, go put it on uh, on Microsoft, whatever they want. They, they basically controlled everything and, and you basically have to take that segment by audiences and things like that. Um, but with Metaverse, it's a little bit different because now marketers have the audience data. They actually understand, we actually understand what's happening with our audiences and which audiences perform the best, which can actually influence the creative and what products we actually put out. So um, what the, the, the big premise here is now it isn't the creative team who's getting briefed from the merchandising teams or, or trying to think of it themselves. It's using the marketing data that we have to distinguish what type of products and what type of virtual assets that the creative team needs to implement inside of this metaverse. Um, and the last one is, is products. And so this is gonna become really, really impactful in the future. Um, oh, sorry, my slide got kind of messed up. But the, the, big, the, big, uh, the big 
thing here is with products and product feeds, as we scale as marketers, I know um, if you are running SCM, you typically have product feeds. That's going to be even more important as we start to scale into having metaverse first creative and, and, um, and, and having products and virtual products inside the metaverse. In the same way that you have, you have um, uh, physical products, you'll also have to have virtual products that can actually scale, uh, that can actually scale out and, and do a lot with. Um, and, and what you're going to see is the same experiences that you have with PLAs is going to have to transfer over to that. So creating the creative and then uploading to product feed, all of that is going to become standard when it comes to how um, you can set your brands up for success in the metaverse. Cool. Now, another way when it comes to virtual goods, and this is where the Web3 part comes about, is when it comes to NFTs. Um, NFTs are a, a, a technology that actually What's funny about this is when I <laughs> created this present, or when I thought about this presentation idea back in March, NFTs were doing so well. Um, now they're not. Uh, there, <laughs> there were so many people on TikTok during COVID that were hyping NFTs. They're like, "Hey, there's always going to be money. It's always going to be growth. You're always going to get put thousands of dollars in NFTs." And now it has really, really crashed. And and so I was luckily one of the, luckily for me, I was one of the people who. Uh, didn't had never invested in NFTs um, because you had to see value out of them, and 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 really um, there was hard. It was hard to get value out of a random token that you know there there was it was not backed by anything, um, and and so for for those of you who uh, I guess I should go backwards and say um, for those of you who want to know what NFTs are, NFTs are basically um, a small group of characters on a bunch of servers uh, that you say you own, and those servers validate that you own uh, that those bunch of characters um, called tokens. So they're they're really tokens. Um, and if somebody else claims that they own those same number of tokens, it goes into these multiple servers, and then it tries to say who actually owns this. Do you own it, or do they own it? And they validate that way. That's my uh, thirty second spiel on on how blockchain works. I I could be trying to, I could be completely wrong on like the nuances of it, but that's basically the general premise is that there's a bunch of servers that validate each transaction that happens. And, and so they know the record of each character, or each token that, that happens across the board. Um, and so uh, there are brands that can actually do NFTs really, really well. Um, but for the most part, NFTs have fallen significantly um, as they weren't providing any value. And I think the biggest reason that NFTs actually collapsed in, in 2022 is there's just too many of them. There was no exclusivity. There was no, um, it, it was very, very tough. I know there was the, the, these NFTs that had, um, had the apes and, and Adidas actually launched out some, uh, some tokens that looked really, really cool that had the Adidas logo and, and they, they had, um, the pictures around them and they did successful at first, but then everyone just started copying the images and then putting them up as their own NFTs. So that artwork that they created that was supposed to be backed by an NFT was just copied over and over again. Um, so it's kind of interesting where it, it could have been where, um, where if, if it had been exclusive, then it would have been great. And I think it would have been looked at really, really um, successfully, but because it was able to be replicated so frequently and, and copied so much, it, it lost a lot of its value. And so the biggest thing when it comes to NFTs, and actually looking back at it, this isn't something that is, is, is going to work for every brand. Um, use, using NFTs and blockchain as an exclusivity mechanism, um, which means the opposite and, uh, of this is, if you want to do this, you have to be exclusive. You cannot be inclusive when it comes to this, right? If you start a token or if you put something out there as a um, as a token and, and as a virtual product, you can't make hundred thousand of them because then that ruins the exclusivity of them. And this is a hard thing for brands to do. There's brands that do this really, really well in, in the physical realm. Because, and I guess physical realm that sounds so nerdy when I say it. Jeez. Um, there's brands that do this really well in the real world, um, 
with Supreme being a great example of a brand that creates certain products and then never releases them again, even though they know that it can make them significantly more money if they just mass produced a certain item that's really, really hot. They won't do it because they, they know that brands trust them to make exclusive, uh, exclusive uh, um, products. Same way shoe drops. So I'm actually a huge, a huge sneakerhead. Um, and, and when they release a, a, a colorway or something, I know that typically Adidas and Nike, whenever they release these, will not reproduce them enough to where I will lose the value of my shoe if I wear it once or never wear it and just leave it in the, in the storage closet, which typically happens. I have about 10 pairs of shoes that I've just never worn and just keep looking at StockX, which is like the website that you can resell shoes to see if the prices will go up. So um, it's, it's one of those things where it takes a lot of discipline for brands to have something that people go crazy about, but then not actually sell more of. Uh, and that's, that in itself is a hard concept to, to grasp for a lot of folks. Um, and it may not be right for every brand as well. Um, but that brings us to NFTs plus the metaverse. And uh, when, when we're looking at NFTs plus the metaverse, it's, uh, there is actually a brand that has done this concept and, and done it fairly well, and that's Nike. Now, this was before we started working with them. So this is from an outsider's perspective looking in. Um, but they created a... Uh, they created something called Nike Land inside of Roblox that was really like a full-fledged amusement park is what it seemed like inside of there. And with that, they actually uh, created these, to these tokens and then they actually created this brand within Nike called Artifact, R-T-F-K-T, Artifact. I, I didn't get it for a long time. I kept saying like, R or whatever, but um, that's what it was. And it was, it was these, these objects inside of Roblox that were backed by Ethereum um, tokens and they were they would drop Nike shoes that were virtual inside the game that you could utilize and it would only drop a certain amount per day I believe it was like 50 per day and you had to wait in line to get it and some people got it some people didn't my, my cousin who was playing Roblox was asking me right when we got uh, right when he heard we started working with Nike that hey can you get me these shoe these virtual shoes in Roblox and I was like I have no idea um, what that even was and so uh, th this is the sub brand that they created to bring out that um, that that buzz and and that thing, but a lot of folks probably haven't heard of that yet. Um, th this brand, the sub brand inside of Nike, because again, it is exclusive. It is something that is something that people want, but you're not going to see everywhere. So um, it's it's a little bit of a uh, shadow brand, I would say, inside of inside of the virtual space and inside of Nike. Um, cool. So just to recap everything that I said, I think I'm pretty good on time, but um, you know. Outside of VR, I'd say the metaverse is here. I think it will get to VR eventually. I would love to be in that Ready Player One uh, seat, but it really is something that will that users are using right now, and, and Gen Z and Gen Alpha are currently really immersed in. Um, but you have to bring value to the people inside the metaverse because you're going to start really with brand zero is what I call it, um, and then have to build up that same presence that you did online as you did offline. Um, and then marketers should use that creative and audience to drive those digital and virtual products together. Um, a lot of times, we're gonna have a lot of power when it comes to the virtual stuff that our, our companies and our brands put out. And this is gonna be a great example of if you can start to build those insights now when, they, when your brands are ready to start delivering virtual products, this is a, a great way to do it. And, and to empower all of us in this room to really to do that. Um, and then last but not least, NFTs are not for every brand. They create exclusivity, not inclusivity. So it's something to take into account when, when your companies are asking, hey, what about NFT? Should we launch our own token um, or launch our own blockchain? So yeah, uh, any questions? Hey, um, let's give Chris a hand real quick. <laughs> now um, for questions, uh, I'm sure we have a, a few. Uh, so I'm going to moderate. What I'd like for you to do is just raise, if you have a question, raise your hand and I will come by with the, uh, let's make sure we get it for the virtual folks, get it on this microphone so they can hear. One quick housekeeping thing um, just before I, because I will forget if they just sent me an email. If, is there anyone in here whose name tag was not printed correctly this morning? Okay. 
After this, please come see me and give me your name. I'm going to email your name to the powers that be, and they will print you a name tag. So just after this, please walk up to me and give me your name. That's all I need. And spell it, please, because I'm horrible at spelling people's names. Hey, who has a question? Let's start over here. So I work with a lot of smaller brands that will are decades away from even thinking about the word token um <laughs> and they have smaller budgets so what are some like baby steps into the metaverse for smaller brands that are not an athleta or a nike but more mom and pop local brands that still want to be on the cutting edge yeah i think uh there are a lot of creators that will partner with smaller brands uh, in, in the same way you have micro influencers who might be local to the brands you you will actually have that as well um, when it comes to the, the content creators who are live streaming or, or um, working in the, the metaverse and stuff like that. So um, if, if you are in Dallas, there, there's quite a few that um, do Minecraft content and actually are local. They don't have the millions of followers that Ninja would have or something like that, but they do have a lot of content. And that actually creates brand equity as well when you're working with those smaller creative creators who are building stuff in the metaverse. Um, a good example is there was somebody who creates sculptures inside of, of Minecraft, and he partnered with a brand that was local to actually build out uh, a their logo inside of that, and he live streamed it. He had about 5,000 to 10,000 followers, um, but it was still a great way where people were watching them build this, so now you have brand equity with 5,000, 10,000 folks as well. Question here. So a similar question about um, NFTs and tokens and moving that into the 3D world. Mm -hmm. So I'm a follower of Club Divine, which is a wine membership. It's very exclusive, but it seems to transfer well from 3D into 2D with a membership that the tokens provide. So same thing. Do you see, what are the steps that you see 3D reaching a larger, what we think of as Web 2 audience? Because the Web 3 audience is really small, but it seems like Web 3 is going to want to get the Web 2 audience. So I guess the question is, how do we get to the Web 2 audience? Yeah, I, I think it'll eventually happen um, as more folks start to go. And like, I'm I'm part of a product I'm part of a product side as well. And there's a product life cycle to everything. We're still in the early adopters phase of like the Web 3 side, but that will shift and 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 grow as as we start to get there. Um, the, the biggest thing is, I wouldn't say don't force it. Like, if your users are in a certain place and in a certain time, trying to force a technology on them typically doesn't work well. Um, it has to bring value to them. And that's the biggest thing is if you can bring value in some way to them, then it'll be easier than trying to force a technology just because it exists. Um, the way I look at it is, Q do you remember QR codes back in like 2010? People were putting them on everywhere and like just stamping them on every product and like trying to get people to like, have content that way. And it just didn't work because people weren't, people didn't want to do it. It was like a new technology that was shiny because of mobile phones, but it wasn't necessarily ready for it. Now in 2020, you'll see them on every single thing as menus apparently are now not a thing anymore at restaurants. Um, you'll see, and people just know now to do it. So that's a great example of like an early technology that people probably try to force and spent maybe a little bit too much money on, but then Nowadays, it's like, okay, I want to get more information. It's useful. It's valuable to me. I'm actually going to do it. Hopefully that answers your question. I know that was like, okay. There's no small hack to do it. Yeah. Anybody else have a question? I have a quick question for you. Yeah. Um, let's talk about measurement. You talked a little bit about that, but uh, I think from my perspective, that's probably one of the hardest things as far as getting a brand to go in and adopt. Um, when they ask, what can you expect? How are you going to measure? What do you, what, what are you, uh, what do you tell them when you're coming in? You know, whether it's Nike or mom and pop, I mean, what are the things that you tell the client as far as how they're going to measure, et cetera? Yeah, there, there's quite a few ways to do it. Um, the way we did it when we worked with Athleta on this was, uh, it, it, we knew it wasn't necessarily there to drive conversions. Um, so we, we had that up front and we said, this is a new thing. Um, we know the target audience that you want to go after is in Roblox, is in some metaverses already. Um, and so 
what we did was we actually took a multiple approach to it. So having multiple KPIs, um, we took into account uh, and, and we surrounded the campaign with content as well. So we worked with influencers and, and micro and uh, micro influencers to um, post about their content, post that. So we were monitoring impressions. Um, there are brand share metrics that you can also get out of out of the game, and and um, and Roblox will actually give you some of those metrics as well around um, some of the the voice of share. Is there a metrics. minimum spend to get that type of data? Um, that I, I actually don't know off the top of my head, but um, yeah. I would imagine that there is. Yes. Yeah. But okay. if, if you were looking at it, you you can also do um, like outside perspective as well. So you can um, look at that data and you can look at the impressions and the engagement that you're getting from your content creators and the content that's around the content you create inside the metaverse. Uh, yeah. Is there any other questions? I, I'm going to follow up with this question if there are. Just real quick. Uh, on that, do you utilize um, any old school 2D stuff like UTM codes? Etc. For tracking, are you do are you, are you mainly relying on data from the uh, the publisher? Mainly around, for this one, we we mainly relied on data from the publisher. Okay. Yes, yes, yeah. Are there any other questions? I have one. Oh, yeah. how do you put the? Wait, hold on, hold on. We got we got virtual people, so they can't hear us. <laughs> Sorry. How would a ser more of a service oriented business approach this? Like we work with a lot of elective medical. LASIK, that kind of thing. And unfortunately, like you're not born blind into the metaverse, so we can't sell you an NFT for LASIK. So how would a serve any kind of service oriented brand work in that? Yeah. So uh, when I was actually talking to this presentation with somebody, they mentioned that somebody tried hosting a conference in the metaverse and like actually having that. And it was a little bit of an awkward experience because half the people were actually in a room. Um, because they were asking me, they're like, Chris, you should set up a Roblox thing and have the virtual people join the, the Roblox group. And I was like, oh, that sounds kind of complicated and, and cumbersome. Um, but what's interesting is this uh, this EXP um, this EXP reality, um, which is it's actually real estate. Um, their their uh, their main customer is actually a real estate company that has a lot of real estate brokers, and they actually in their metaverse have conferences that they'll host once a month that have speakers who are going into auditoriums and speaking. Um, there's actually a really cool TikTok video on it. If you Google EXP um, Metaverse, you might actually find it. Um, but they that that's that's how they're doing their their meeting greeting of all their realtors that are there. So in a service based industry, similar to how we are working here in at Safe Search, we're meeting all together. Um, is there an opportunity to maybe combine the live streaming uh, knowledge that we got here with potentially like a thing where it says, "Hey, everyone, come to this location. We're going to have a um, we're going to have an online metaverse type conference where people can go and speak to each other. Yeah. yeah I think, did you have a question? One, type yeah. one more. And then after, I'm sure Chris will be around. So you can ask him some yeah, questions. for sure. Have you seen brands doing dual use uh, customizable products between like real products and it? I'm thinking like American Girl dolls or Build a Bear or something like that, where they can create an actual physical product and then give you the NFT for Roblox or Minecraft or something like that. Yes, Adidas did a similar concept where they actually had the token printed on an Adidas hoodie. Um, that was a really, really cool uh, concept as well. I, the, the part where I've seen it break down a lot is now when someone tries to sell that, it's, you can't necessarily sell the token with the physical good. So like the whole, it, it's great for collector's items that are never gonna sell. But if you ever wanna sell the collector's item, it, you have to make sure that you sell the, you have to transfer the the token plus the physical good, and typically, if you don't do that, then you lose the value out of it. So I think people are also realizing that before they're buying that and saying, "Well, I can sell the hoodie, but then if I keep the NFT, then whoever's going to buy the hoodie is are they getting any value out of it?" And so it becomes more difficult. I, I actually read about people doing this with uh, baseball memorabilia, like yeah, playing cards and yeah. Exactly. Transfer. Yeah. So that's that's the hard part is policing that and it's hard to to police it. Okay. Well, unfortunately, yeah. I think we are just, you know, we're supposed to go to 1050. Yeah. So we are out of time. Um, 
but if you have any questions, please come up and ask Chris. And uh, thank you for coming out. And if you have any other things, anything, any other problems, 